godliness with contentment. We brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. If we have food and clothing, with these we shall be content. That is a stunning statement, especially for us here in America, the Western Hemisphere. With food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Now, I suspect that if the Apostle Paul lived in Alaska and lived there during the winter, he would probably add shelter to this list. So even if we say, okay, he's assuming shelter in bad climates, that's still a pretty short list on the needs list. Food, clothing, shelter when there's rough weather. Um, and so the question I have is, well, how do you learn to be content? If these are our needs, food and clothing and maybe shelter, how does somebody become content? And so as I think about this, I think that all of us have sort of an unwritten list of needs that we just sort of walk around with. We just assume our legitimate needs. And we do this in every arena of life. Uh, if you're single, you have certain needs that you think of. If you're a husband, you have certain needs that you think of. If you're a wife, you have certain needs that you think of. If you're a child or a teenager, you have a long list of needs that you're pretty sure mom and dad are supposed to meet. Uh, when you go to work, you have needs that you just assume your boss or your work environment is supposed to, to meet. At the same time, we walk around with a list of desires. As, as persons, as a husband and wife, and as a parent, uh, as a worker or a boss. And these lists are just invisible. They're fluid. Now, as we live our life, what happens is we inevitably run into a brick wall that says that some of the needs that we have on our needs list apparently really aren't needs, but should be in the desires list. And over the course of time, it appears to me that God is working on our needs list almost invisibly to say, uh, no, no, you don't need that. It's a legitimate desire but that is not a need. Now, why is that important? The more needs that we have on our needs list that really should be on the desires list, the more discontent we're going to find ourselves. And so God in his mercy to us over and over and over again comes into our lives and, and some of the needs we just insist on that we have to have, God says, no, 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 and there's pushback on this. And he's trying to help us with our own hands take those needs and give them to God, and then put them in the desire list. Over the course of time, this is what I think Paul means when he says, I learned to be content. Taking neat things we think we need and putting them in the desires list. Verse 12, he says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. And when I think of the secret of being content... Uh, one of the instruments I think about is this desire, this needs and desires list. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul has a long list of the difficulties that he found himself living in this life. And uh, I just have one, one set of these in verse 27. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure... And it's at this point in, the, in Philippians 4 that he says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Uh, certainly there have been things in, in my life where I, I go to this verse for, in all kinds of arenas, and, and, and many of you have done the same thing. But I think that in, down in the heart, the strength that I need is the strength that Christ can provide to take things that I think are in need and give those to God and let him put them in the desires category. And to take what I think is a need, what, seem, what is a felt need, and to look deeper into that need as a need that only God can meet. This particular aspect of this, this needs and desires list is something that only God can expose to us and help us see uh, as we come to him humbly and ask him to do this. Uh, Verse 14, he picks up this idea of generosity, and he sees generosity there as an investment. It was good of you to share in my troubles. Uh, there are plenty of people that would have concern for Paul, uh, but many times it's only this particular church that put their concern into action. 
Verse 15, moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. When I think about this, uh, Paul trying to, <coughs> Macedonia is modern day Greece, trying to op- start a new church in the wicked city of Corinth, uh, the areas of Galatia uh, in modern day Turkey and uh, Macedonia. Um, These folks were on board with him doing this and providing him and his team finances to be able to start new churches. But as Paul says, they were the only ones that were. It makes me think about when we were, when Mindy and I were back in Texas, fresh graduates of the seminary, and we were helping to get Hope Church started with uh, Harold Bullock in Fort Worth. And um, myself and another guy, we we raised... uh, part of our salary in order to be our first two um, staff guys after Harold. Uh, Raising support was something I'd never done before, and I sent out letters and talked to people and talked to them about the investment that they could make in Hope Church and getting that, which which is now an amazing church, getting off the ground and having sort of the, uh, an ante in the pot, so to speak, of something that was going to be an investment for a long period of time. Many years later, that church has started over 200 churches around the world. And the folks who had, uh, had the foresight and wisdom to invest in that particular church, I think are going to be amazed when we get to heaven and see what their investment has done. But when I first started out, the first time doing this, I had a very small uh, number of people who said, yes, we want to support you and Mindy. Uh, I, I was rather shocked by that. I, I thought there'd be a lot more people. When we moved out here in 1985, we had to raise about half our salary um, and had another list of people and sent out letters and talked to people. And, and, um, and folks responded, and we were able to be able to do this full time. That was an investment for those people. It was an investment in my life, in Mindy's life, and in the life of the church now over 30 years later. Verse 16, even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Verse 17, not that I am looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. Now, Paul, several times in this passage, wants to make sure that they understand that this thank you note is not a guilt trip, so they'll give him more the next time he needs it. He goes, the whole contentment piece that he just talked about is directed at that. Here, he says, the most important thing about your gift is not what happened for me, but what's going to happen for you. And he uses two banking terms. He says that that what you gave may be credited to your account. And here he's thinking about a heavenly account that all of us are going to have with God one day. Uh, There are times when we go to the store and we buy something uh, and we have to take it back. And we used a a credit card to buy it, and we go back to the store, we take it back and show the receipt. And of course, you, most of you have probably done this. They want to see your credit card, and they put it in their little machine, and your account is now credited with bringing back the, whatever the item was. And so there's no money out of your pocket for that item. Now, that's what Paul says about this. He says, um, be sure that you know that heaven watched and took account of what you gave to, to, the, to the ministry here now in Rome, or when he was in Greece before, uh, and it was credited to your account. Except that we know from Jesus and giving that whenever we give, we cannot give God. And so rather than in your credit card statement just having a credit back to what you give, I think you and I are going to be shocked when we get to heaven to see how much more was added by God because of our generosity and giving to other people. That's what he's appealing to and wants them to see in this verse here. And then what strikes me again at, at, as we get near the end of this passage is there's, it's one thing to be generous with money, but uh, it's another thing to be generous as a person. Verse 18, he says, I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, meaning there's really no need to send anything more. You don't have to think about that. Again, this is his third way of saying, I'm very happy with what you've done. This is not a guilt trip. But then notice what he says. He adds value, a different kind of value, to their giving. 
Their gifts are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. When I was in Thailand over the last couple of weeks, we spent the first few days in Bangkok. And while we were walking downtown Bangkok, there were different shrines to Buddha. Uh, and something I learned was that the, most of the time when I see a statue of Buddha, it's the, I think of this as the fat, jolly guy sitting down with the big, you know, the big beer belly. Um, but in Thailand, they have a very different picture of Buddha. All the statues are more of a very refined, revered, sort of have it all together kind of picture. Uh, and around the city, there were different shrines, and people would come, and they were either giving flowers. Uh, some were, had, had holy water that they were uh, pouring on themselves. Uh, but incense was in the air everywhere. In fact, one of the hotel's rooms that, that uh, my roommate and I stayed in, it had been like <coughs> there had been incense in there for years. Uh, I've, I've never had that kind of smell in a hotel room. Uh, but he says that their gift is a fragrant offering, something that smells wonderful, something that brings delight. Uh, and it's a reference to the Old Testament time when the incense was in the, in the temple and in the tabernacle, a fragrant offering that went up to God, pleasing to him. The second thing, he says, an acceptable sacrifice. Now, Jesus is the sacrifice for our sin, but so he sort of alludes with the sacrifice for sin, with their sacrifice of finances and a gift, almost as if they sort of go hand in hand. One leads to the other. He adds value, significant value to their gift. And the third one, he says, pleasing to God. And when I think about this, I think about when I was a little boy and even a teenager, I don't know if there was a day that went by that I didn't want to please my dad. It seemed like that was always in front of me. I wanted to, to please my dad. I wanted, wanted to know that he was pleased with his son. And, um, and that hunger just seemed to be there every day. And it seemed to be such an elusive thing to, to get uh, that sense of, of pleasure from my dad. Here, he says, pleasing to God. And in the, in the final analysis... Uh, you and I have that desire at the deepest parts of our soul, whether we're, we're aware of it or not, to want to know that our life is pleasing, not just to somebody, but to Almighty God. And he says, your gift did it. Did it, added value. Verse 19, my God will meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ. On the back of your handout, there's a parallel passage that I love. The Corinthian church uh, which once had been a, um, a church with all kinds of issues and messes. Uh, but God was at work in their life. And this passage I want to read is very similar to the passage we're reading in Philippians chapter 4. The point is this, he says, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Doesn't it sound a lot like the, the passage we just read in Philippians 4? And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, Philippians 4.19, so that you may always have enough of everything and may provide in abundance for every good work, just like the Philippians had done. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your resources and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for great generosity, not just financially as we think about it, but in every way as a person, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God, similar to pleasing to God. For the rendering of this service not only supplies the wants of the saints, but also overflows in many thanksgivings to God. Under the test of this service, you will glorify God by your obedience and acknowledgement, the gospel of Christ, and by the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Now we come to the close of this particular letter of Philippians 4. Uh, and the last four verses, uh, as I think about you know, how you close a letter is, is important. And, and when you write letters that finally get down to the last part. And there's a sort of that time where you're, how do I want to finish this? What is it I want to say to the folks? 
And so these last four verses, I think, are Paul's sort of pause. How do I want to finish this letter to these people? Verse 20. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And he takes them back to what is the north star of life, the glory of God, that my life might make a difference and shine the light upon him, that other people might say, I think there may be a God because I can see it in Seth, or I can see it in this church, or I can see it in you. Uh, Verse 21, greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. And of course, saints in the New Testament is not the Catholic saints or the super Christians, how the Catholics use this term. But saint is a term he uses for all of us garden variety Christians, which means we are set apart for God's purposes. What he does here is he finishes this letter is he says, I want to remind you of how God sees you. He doesn't see you as a spiritual loser. He doesn't see you as always taking three steps forward and two or three steps backward. Or when am I going to ever going to get this right? Or when am I ever going to be like Christ? That's not how he sees you. The way he sees you is saint or set apart for his purposes. That's how he sees us. Paul reminds them of this. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household, which is a fascinating thing because back in chapter 1, you may remember when he was in house arrest, uh, he had uh, members of the Praetorian Guard that were to guard him around the clock. And so he had a very, you know, they thought they had a captive uh, prisoner. He had a captive audience with them. And so he was sharing the Lord with these people. And chapter 1, he talks about how that the gospel was spreading through the Praetorian Guard as some of these men became Christians. And now they were sharing with their friends and other soldiers. And here he says, to those who belong to Caesar's household. The gospel has spread not just through to some of the guard, prison guards, but now to some of the people that work uh, in, the, uh, in Rome's version of the White House uh, or Congress, uh, Caesar's household, those who are a uh, some relatives of his and some who work for him. And then he finishes with, again, just the the way he starts so many of his letters, he finishes with grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And grace is how all of us became Christians to start with, not because I tried hard or because I was such a good person or I was sincere or I went to church or I gave. None of that is how, how we become Christians. We become Christians in spite of ourselves. We say, I am a sinner, and I do deserve judgment, and I cannot make myself better. I need a Savior. And and God says to him, to us, yes. And he provides the very thing that our hearts need, the forgiveness of sins, a washing away of our sin, and when he comes in to live a brand new life as brand new people. He sees us as his people, his saints. We started off with grace And he finishes here by saying, and we continue with grace. When I think about this issue of when he he talks about their identity as saint and of grace, again, this is how he sees us. He sees us as his people. He sees us as his children. He sees us as the, the day when we're going to come to him as the bride of Christ, when he will be the groom. And collectively, as his people, as his church, we will be his bride. That is how he sees us. It's the wonder of grace. Uh, In my trip to Thailand, there were uh, 20 of us from four different churches. Uh, 11 from a church in Chico, seven from our church back in Fort Worth, uh, me from here, and two from a church in Ontario. Uh, the fellow that set up the, 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 um, all the airfare put the two ladies in Ontario and me on the same flight uh, from, to LAX. I'd never met these two gals. They are about the age of my kids. Um, one of them, they're both mothers. One's about uh, almost 40 and the other one's about 35. One of them has three teenagers, God help her, and the other one has three, has three uh, uh, kids in elementary school. I'd never met them before, um, but they were at the gate at LAX waiting, and I showed up, and I realized, they kind of, oh, you're Seth, you know, come on over here, and we introduced ourselves. 
Uh, we spent 13 hours together on a flight from LAX to Seoul, Korea. Got to know each other pretty well. We were at the airport in Seoul, Korea for an hour and a half, and then we had a six-hour flight to Bangkok. We got to know each other very well during that six hours. During the 10 days that we were in country, uh, we did some service projects together along with the, the rest of the team, the 20. And then it was time to come back, and the three of us, the two uh, young moms and I were on the plane from Bangkok to Shanghai. I think it was five hours. I was so jet-lagged, I don't know how long that was. Then we had a six-hour layover in Shanghai, and then we had, I think it was a 12-hour flight from Shanghai back to LAX, and we arrived Monday night at 7 p.m. Now, during a trip like that, you get to know people really well, and especially all those hours in flight with these two young mothers, I got to know them very well. Um, and they are delightful young ladies, delightful young Christians. We got to LAX uh, Monday night, and one of their husbands was on his way over from Ontario to pick, to pick them up. And I just decided, I was in no hurry to get home. I just decided to wait with them until the husband showed up, make sure that they're, they've got their ride and they're on their way home. So uh, he, he, was, he got there about 30 minutes because traffic at LAX is horrendous now. He finally pulled in, and we were packing up their suitcase in the back of the trunk. And as I was about to say goodbye to them, I thought, I may never see these two again. Uh, we don't cross, cross paths, particularly. Um, but as, as we stood there packing up their suitcases, I was reminded of what Paul had just said to these people in, in Philippi. And how God saw them as saints set apart for his purposes and a people of grace. And I was struck by three things that I told them. I said, I want you to know that when God sees you too, he already sees you in the wedding dress he has picked out for you for that day that's coming. One of them teared up immediately, the older one. I said, also, I want you to know that in those 11 days we were in country, I don't know if you saw this, but whatever you were doing brought him great delight. And the third thing I said to him is, you may not have noticed, but if you turned around to see him looking at you, you would have seen a sparkle in his eye. That is how Paul finishes this letter. He wants them to remember what it's like to live in grace. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the wonder of grace that, that is freely given, poured out for people who do not have it together, even after all these years as Christians, and who, who still struggle to, to try to be like your son and find it, find it such a difficult task, sometimes seemingly impossible, and yet the wonder of grace never gives up on us and continues to offer mercy every day and lifts us up again and creates a hunger to want to be like your son that deepens with time. And over time, we begin to believe that the truth about how you see us, that you see us as your children, as a saint set apart for you. You see us as holy. You can see if the, ahead to that day when we will see you face to face. And there is delight in your eye. And little by little, we believe that. And, we've, and that comes to form our identity. This is what you are forming in your people. Help us to see this. Help us to embrace it. We thank you that Jesus makes all this possible. In his name, amen.